It was people like Jim Gollin, like Bob and Wendy Graham, who were married at that time, like Deb Emmersheim, like Ella Alford, uh, people, SVNers, people that uh, many of you who were in the early SVN days know. And, um, and Josh Mailman, of course. Everybody would always take Josh at the beginning of anything, because he's an initiator. Um, and so we, um, we went down to Quito. We traveled down the Valley of Volcanoes. Uh, we went down through the Cordova Forest, over the eastern side of the Andes, down the Mastasa River Canyon, uh, all the way to the base of the Amazon. At that time, the roads were all dirt. Uh, getting to the Amazon, we hired a military plane to fly us into Schwar territory, where John had relationships, and then with two uh, guides who had been in Ashwar territory briefly and, and built the bridge for this first encounter with the Ashwar, we flew into Ashwar territory three, uh, this is a roadless place now, no roads, they won't ever allow roads, and one of the most remote uh, rainforests in the world, right on the equator. Um, we flew in uh, three people at a time, and then the Shabar pilot would go back and get three more, and then three more, and then three more, until we were all 12 standing there uh, on a, a kind of a dirt area next to the river. And then they came out of the forest with their orange geometric face paint, and their yellow red feather crowns, spears, everything like a movie. Only it wasn't a movie. And, um, and we spent uh, five, six days with the uh, Achuar leaders, during which um, we were invited to see their shaman. Uh, and uh, they, they killed a wild boar, and we had a feast with them. Uh, and then uh, we we had an opportunity to participate with their main teaching plan, which is ayahuasca. And in the course of all of that, uh, what now is called the Pachamama Lions was born. And I think I should... Okay. <laughs> I think I should show you um, a little film about the Pachamama Lions. So you get the whole picture. Uh, it probably is faster than me going on and on here. Um, so it, uh, it takes about 30 seconds to get this film ready. So there they are getting it ready. Um, and this is about 12 minutes long. Um, but that's the real story. We don't talk about this with everybody. I don't go around saying this. Um, I was working for the Hunter Project at the time. I was responsible for 47 countries. As I told you, there was no way I could respond to this. But fortunately, I know it sounds terrible, I got malaria, um, which meant that I couldn't work for anybody or do anything, but uh, for a year, really take care of my health, which allowed me to really think about what was I being called to do. I had taken a stand, which is the title of this talk, for ending world hunger for the rest of my life. And I was completely devoted to the Hunger Project. I was the Hunger Project. It wasn't like I worked there. I was the Hunger Project. Uh, yet, um, this call uh, became clear to me was uh, not, not, it wasn't, and, and for my husband Bill, who was running a big company at the time, he was a corporate guy, and you know, he was a big donor to the Hunger Project. I wanted him to keep him donating, keep working over there so he can keep donating. <laughs> Uh, but for both of us, it was not our plan for ourselves, but it was clearly our destiny. We didn't speak Spanish, we knew nothing about the environment, we weren't ecologists, we weren't even thinking about the rainforest like many of you here were, like Bill Sharman has been for years and years and years. But we uh, were called, and part of the gift of it was we were a blank canvas. We had no agenda. And we went down, and the Achuar really uh, told us, if you're coming to help us, don't waste your time. This is a famous indigenous quote from, uh, from uh, the Aborigines in Australia. It's also true for the Amazonian people. If you're coming to help us, don't waste your time. But if you're coming because you know your liberation is bound up with ours, then let's work together. Mm -hmm. And out of that ethic, out of that stand, Understanding that our liberation, your liberation, my liberation, the liberation of a culture that's gone to sleep, that has a, a distorted dream for the future, a dream, a nightmare dream of consumption and acquisition that we need to wake up from, that indigenous people who are not caught in that dream 
uh, can liberate us and we can liberate them. So uh, in Pachamama Lines, this is a short film about our work. Uh, so that, oh, sorry. Um, so that's kind of the whole story. I'll, I'll just say a couple of other things about what we're up to. And this, this blending of indigenous wisdom and modern world knowledge is also the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy called the Prophecy of the Evil and the Condor, which many of you may know, that's been told in the Andes and the Amazon for really millennia. And um, first of all, the word Pachamama is a Quechua word. Quechua people are the largest indigenous language group in the world. It's a pre-Incan language, and embedded in that language is a relationship with the natural world and all species, it, embedded in cultures really usually embedded in language. And um, Quechua speaking people have a worldview that's critical for us to be exposed to, we think. Uh, so the word Pachamama means the uh, Mother Earth, or the Earth, the sky, the universe, and all time. Um, and so this is an alliance between indigenous people, conscious uh, indigenous people, but uh, indigenous people and conscious committed people <coughs> from the modern world like you. And it blends together ancient wisdom and modern world knowledge in a way that sort of blends the mind and heart of humanity for a new way forward. And the prophecy of the eagle and the condor has been told in the Andes and the Amazon for millennia also in North America, um, saying that this particular time in history is the beginning of what's called the 10th Pachacutic. Um, uh, those are 500 year earthly cycles in the, their understanding of the natural world. The last Pachacuta, which is 500 years long, began in 1492. That's a familiar year for many people. And it was called the Pachacuta of Dominance and Darkness. And in about 1992, uh, the beginning of the change of Pachacutics began. We were called to the Amazon in 1994. The change in a Pachacutic takes about 25 years. This is the next Pachacutic, the 10th, and the prophecy for thousands of years have said that this is the prophecy, this is the time, this is the Pachacutic, when the eagle and condor will come together. The eagle uh, means people who perceive, the part of humanity who perceives life primarily through the mind. Um, and the eagle people are people like us, who are very skilled in the material world, who uh, are very skilled with our mind. The prophecy said that at this time in history, we would invent tools to extend the capacity of our own minds, which I think is a prophecy about the computer. Uh, and the prophecy says we will be in, uh, uh, materially um, uh, wealthy and at a zenith in our capacity to use our mind and our culture at this time in history, but we will be spiritually evil people will be spiritually impoverished to their peril and their very survival will be at risk. The condor people refers to the indigenous people who perceive life primarily through the five senses and the wisdom of the heart and are trafficking primarily in the spirit world. They see spirit in this chair, they see spirit in the shawl, in the microphone, everything. Um, and uh, the prophecy says that the condor people will have a highly, highly sophisticated relationship with their way of life. Their intuitive skills will be highly tuned, the way the eagle people's mind skills will be tuned. They will be at a zenith in their understanding of other species, of the natural world, of the wisdom of the heart at this time in history. But they will be materially impoverished to their peril in any encounter with the evil world. So this is the time when the eagle people and the condor people, or the eagle and the Condor will remember that they are each other, fly together in the same sky again, wing to wing, and the world will come back in the balance. It's a very positive, uplifting um, prophecy, and they're absolutely certain that uh, they would say that this meeting, uh, that SVN, that the Pachamama Alliance, that uh, the indigenous uh, network, that uh, that your work, Joe Flood, and the work of many people here uh, is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Uh, and that the world is coming back into 
uh, what they call the next Pachacuti, which is the Pachacuti of balance and light, this next 500 years. They've also said that the change from the last Pachacuti and this Pachacuti of 25 years will be the time when Pachamama, the earth, humbles her creatures with tsunamis, with huge climactic changes, with tidal waves, with volcanic eruptions, with earthquakes, so that all creatures will remember their rightful role in relationship with her as we go into the Pachacutic of Balance and Life. That has been the prophecy about this time of history for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So this meeting, who you are, what you stand for, the stands you've taken, um, are in many ways, they would say, the fulfillment of this great prophecy. Um, so Pachamama Alliance, uh, really out of a profound relationship with indigenous people, now is at work not only to uh, uh, stand with them to protect their lands and cultures, uh, and we work with the Achwar, the Shwar, the Shiwiar, the Kofan, the Kogi, the Uwa, the Zapro, the Kichwas. We work with all the indigenous groups in the Amazon, in Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, and Brazil. Um, and that work is uh, flourishing. There's threats, uh, but it's flourishing, really. Um, uh, and there's lots to say about that. There's constant threats from oil and mining and all the different things that you read about. But indigenous people, for example, in Ecuador, uh, are, uh, their voices are heard, they have a political majority, and as you saw in the film, uh, it was the first country in the world, and we moved to Ecuador in 2008 to participate in this process. They did a constitutional assembly. Uh, they wrote a brand new 21st century constitution rooted in the concept, the Quechua concept of sumac kausai, which means the good life, the rich life, the full life, not a better life. They never talk comparatively, but the full rich life. Um, and they wrote a constitution that does, is the first constitution in the world that gives legal rights to nature under fundamental primary law river systems, forest systems, have legal rights in court in Ecuador, now also in Bolivia, now also we're working with Peru, Colombia, Nepal, uh, Holland, New Zealand, uh, the Rights for Nature movement, which is a uh, really remarkable paradigm busting kind of Magna Carta moment, changing our relationship with the earth through a legal, uh, a legal paradigm shift from property, you can do whatever you want to it, to actually nature has rights. There have been three cases in Ecuador. You know, the lawyers and judges have no idea what to do with this. You know, do you prosecute someone for cutting their lawn? You know, it's really kind of uh, difficult. Um, but it's now there's precedent, and it's a really brilliant new um, kind of breakthrough in thinking in our relationship with the earth. We're also working um, and out, of, out of our relationship with indigenous people. These insights are totally coming from them. We're working on uh, a liberation economy, another money system. And in Ecuador, there's an alternative money system that's bringing people who are in the informal economy into a split barter system. Uh, the government is totally OK with it. The banking system has blessed it because they can't serve those people. That's another thing we're doing. So there's so, so many cool things we're doing um, uh, that come out of this uh, collaboration between indigenous ways of seeing the world uh, and modern world thinking. So um, I, I want to, uh, uh, let's see, what do I want to tell you? Um, all of this comes from a stand. So the title of this talk is supposed to be <laughs> Taking a Stand. Um, and I, I want to distinguish what I understand a stand to be. I know the men's group did a stand taking exercise of some kind. So I really looked into what does it mean to take a stand? And because it's so powerful when you do it, it covered your entire life. You have no control over it anymore, which is kind of a cool thing. You surrender to a destiny that you don't even know what it is. And I say that taking a stand is distinct from taking a position, and I want to distinguish it. Taking a position for or against something, which is useful and important, and there's nothing wrong with it, and I know we all do that. Uh, Taking the position, I think we want to be aware of, always generates its opposition, always. That's the, at least my view of the dynamic of taking a position. So yes creates no, 
Up really creates down. Left creates right. Here creates there. Us creates them, etc. Um, you know, pro-life really creates pro-choice. Pro-choice really, when it gets more entrenched, gets pro-life more entrenched, etc. You can kind of see that in the political spectrum. Um, it's not that positions aren't important to take, but it's distinct from taking a stand. Taking a stand is different. Taking a stand moves you from having a point of view. So Drummond is sitting here at this table. He has a point of view of, of this screen and this presentation. Uh, and, and someone over there, Mark Lesser, has a different point of view in this room. Um, a point of view is useful. It's important. But when you, when you take a stand, you move from having a point of view or a position to having vision. You no longer have a point of view, you have vision. And when you take a stand, you can hear all positions. You can hear all voices. There is room for, their, for them to be heard, for them to be affirmed, for them to be listened to, not in agreement or disagreement. Uh, and once a position or a point of view is heard, truly heard, and what I'll call recreated, it can dissolve in service of a higher goal, which is what you stand for. Um, so Gandhi took a stand. Uh, Martin Luther King was a stand taker. Uh, I call uh, Nelson Mandela a stand taker. Most stand takers never have a position of authority when they take their stand. They derive their authority not out of a position like presidency or the head of something. They derive, and they might have that role, but they derive their authority out of the stand that they've taken. And there's nothing I think more powerful than that. And anyone can take a stand. Um, Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and I'll move the world. And you can, and you will, and you do. So I wanted to um, invite you, I'm going to show you one more film at the very end here about the Four Years Go campaign, which is designed to support the stand you've taken, um, whatever it is. So I wanted to give you a chance to uh, talk to a person next to you at your table. I'd like you to sort of clump up in twos or threes, not fours and fives, because that'll take too long, but twos and threes. Um, and uh, if you clump up first, then I will give you your instructions. So first, find your partner, either one partner or two partners. I'd love to do another SBM trip. That first SBM trip was a huge success. You can see 16 later, years later what has happened. There's now thousands and thousands and thousands of people leading this program called the Awakening Dreamer Symposium. It's now in 61 countries. We just heard there was two symposiums in Syria, one in Tunisia, one in Egypt. Uh, one in Iran, um, uh, so it's, it's really out there. And that started really here, so I'd love to take another SVM route down the rainforest, see what happens next. But let me um, just say one of the people we took to, uh, to Oshawa Territory to the rainforest was Dan Wyden, who's the CEO of Wyden and Kennedy, uh, the largest independent ad agency in the world. He, he invented Just Do It for Nike, and he fought that up. Uh, he fought up the real thing for Coke. He, th he thinks that he's a genius. Um, his clients are, you know, Toyota, and they're everybody. The Old Spice commercials are his work. So um, uh, Dan, at the end of the trip, uh, he, he sat across from Bill, my husband and I, and he said, you know, this is, this is I, I get it, I get it. What can I do? I have a large independent ad, ad, ad agency in the world. I'm never going to sell it. I own it. I'm a CEO. Uh, what can I do? And we said to him, First of all, I had to think about it because that was a tall, uh, big order, big offer. We said, help us change the dream of the modern world. That's the assignment from the indigenous people. And he said, well, I've been selling people things they don't need for 40 years. <laughs> and I've been promoting that dream. Uh, the dream of consumption, of acquisition, of accumulation. This will save my soul. Let's go to work. So we created with him, he created, they created, they're just amazing people, this ad agency, with Pachamama Alliance and our indigenous partners, a campaign called Four Years Ago. Why four years? Because in their research,
people know that a transformation can take place in four years. They went to high school, they were one way, they came out another way. They went to college one way, they came out another way. The four years between the Olympics, the four years between the World Cup, the four years between big things can happen. Um, also, because there's a window of time, and we all know there is with the climate crisis, uh, that after which things will become irreversible. And we don't know how long that window is. It's maybe 13 years, maybe it's 30, maybe it's two. But we're declaring or asserting that the choices we make in the next four years may very well, probably will, determine the future of life on Earth for the next 1,000. And if people knew that, if people were awake to that, if people could actually get that, it would ennoble their life. It would give them a reason for living. It would let them know that we're living in a time where we can be, live the most meaningful lives any generation of humankind has ever lived. People who are willing to be awake to the privilege of having our choices matter in that deep and profound way. And we also saw from the work of Al Gore that I think some of you may know, he did 30 solution summits over three years, and he came back saying, we got enough solutions for three climate crises and we only got one. What's missing is the will to act. So the climate crisis, given that it's, a, it's, a t it's got a fuse, is a gift to all the issues we stand for. Hunger, poverty, the empowerment of women, ending child abuse. All of them have languished for centuries. But with the timeline, we can actually turn the tide of history away from an inhospitable, unsustainable, violent, dark future towards a sustainable, uh, hospitable, peaceful, nourishing future in the next four years. And our example of history is the, is the Renaissance. The Renaissance, although if you read about it, hundreds of years it took to get out of the Dark Ages into the Renaissance in Europe, but there was a pivot point. There was a pivot point. It was fomented by 200 people, less people than are in the SBM. And it was funded by uh, two families and it was invented, the Renaissance coming out of the Dark Ages into the Renaissance, there was a pivot point for about 25 years, uh, and that was right when Gutenberg invented the printing press. If you look now, we've got millions of white people, not just 200, uh, and, we have and we have zillions of dollars, and we have communication tools to die for. We can turn the tide. That doesn't mean everything's resolved in four years, but the trajectory of the human family shifts from a dark, dangerous future to the possible, powerful, beautiful future we all want. And then we can go to work knowing we're on that path. So that's the point of the four years ago media campaign. And I'm going to show you a little two-minute video, and then my time is up. But I invite you to go to the four years ago website, sign up. We're going to launch my stand, which is the next evolution of the four years ago website, not website campaign, which is going to have gaming mechanics in it. We're going to be uh, able to serve a billion people to put, uh, not just be on farm bill playing games, but play the game of life, turning the tide, and track it on the web so hundreds of millions of people can play the game of shifting the trajectory of the human family. Uh, and that will end up being a, a commercial venture with Weidman, Kennedy, and other ad agencies, but kind of incubated by the Pachamama Alliance. So I'm ready now for the four years ago video. I think I said pretty much everything I want to say about it. Did I just let me check? So it's designed to illuminate, amplify, accelerate, and awaken people to your stand, my stand, everything we stand for in a way that the, the trajectory of history shifts from where we're headed to the, the future that we all want. So here's a little video.